Okay, welcome everybody. It's so nice to see you. Thank you for being here. And I'd like to remind everybody on Zoom if you could mute so we can keep the noise level down, that would be great. Um, I just want to welcome both members as well as our guests. I know we have some guests here tonight. And we also have a new member here, Marilyn. And we'd like to stand up, Marilyn, and tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been a uh, focus member many, many years ago uh, for a lot of years. And uh, I, many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and um, have uh, actually, I stopped, uh, stopped coming when you all moved from the centennial offices all, all the way down Ooh, south. Yeah, <laughs> uh -huh. So, um, anyway, I've got some spare time. I've had a portrait studio for many years and I've just closed it and I'm in the process of selling all my props and backdrops and everything. And so I have extra time and uh, uh, am looking for inspiration and I'm happy to be back and see some faces that yeah. I remember from many years ago. <laughs> well, welcome. <laughs> yeah. Nice to have you back. Thank you so much. Okay, um, and then I also want to thank Scott Wilson for being here tonight, um, and we'll hear more from him later. Uh, also, I want to take a few minutes to take care of some housekeep housekeeping things, and two, there are two things that are really important to focus, and the first one is uh, mentoring, and so I have an opportunity I want to bring up and remind everyone again that we do have two types of mentoring opportunities uh, for new members, but also whoever wants to be mentored in any particular area of photography. We can do one-on-one -on -one mentoring if you'd like to work with one person. And uh, we can work that out in person, or if you guys decide you want to do it via Zoom, whatever, that's, that's up to the person to mentor. And then quarterly, at least quarterly, we try to do um, activities where we go out. And sometimes we go out and shoot together, and you can shoot alongside a mentor and get some information there. Um, we sometimes have lunch afterwards so we can talk, look at our photos, things like that. So I just want to bring that up so that you know that that is uh, one of our important, one of our most important things that we try to do and take advantage of that. Just let us know if you'd like to be mentored. And then the second is volunteers. Um, this organization would not be what it is without our volunteers. Volunteers are essential. So I bring that up because tonight we have a uh, Long-time volunteer who, this is his last night. So would you come on up, Dave? Sure. <laughs> Dave and John's gonna do this, but. <laughs> That's okay, I, I won't <laughs> Okay, so Dave has been a faithful volunteer for several years and uh, he is co-chair of the program committee. So him along with another co-chair is actually responsible for this program tonight. And he, in addition, um, brought us some great programs in the past. So I'd be remiss in not bringing him up to say okay. thank you very much for all that you've done for us. Do you have something there? Okay. And would you join me in this thank you. You just leave. Okay, so. so Alexa stays right. <laughs> so. Okay. So are there any other announcements before I move on from anybody else? When? I think we have more guests in the back. Oh, yes. Let's acknowledge the guests. Would you just raise your hands, please, those that are guests here tonight? Thank you so much. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I think I got a chance to talk to each of you as you came here, but we're so glad to have you here. And uh, if you'd like any, any more information about the club, you know, just check out the website and uh, we'll answer any questions that you have. So, to keep us moving along, if there's another no announcement, I'll turn it over to Dave so that he can introduce our guest speaker tonight, Scott Wilson. Thank you, Victoria. Uh huh. Sure. Well, I wanted to extend my welcome to not only the, the people in this room, we have just uh, kind of south of, of 20 people. I don't know uh, if Carl could maybe give us a report of how many people are doing these on Zoom, but I did want to you know, welcome all the members and the, and the guests, not only here in the room, but on, on Zoom as well. So as Victoria mentioned, my name is Dave Hull. I am the, the co-chair of programs this year, along with uh, my, my colleague, Terry, Terry Hanford. And tonight's speaker is Scott Wilson. So Scott's program tonight is the evolving role that photo advocacy has played in his life and photographic career. Uh, for many of you that know Scott, he needs no introduction. You're, you're familiar with him socially. You follow him on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, you visit his gallery. 
for many of the, for, for a few of us or a few of you that, that don't know Scott, you're in for a real treat tonight, okay? He is, I'm sure that once you listen to his program, you're gonna to start to want to know more about this gentleman. And you're gonna to want to visit his gallery. You're gonna to want to sell, follow him on social media. You're gonna to to look at his website. And who knows, maybe you'll, you'll be enamored with his, his uh, photographs so much that you'll even want to buy a photograph or two and hang them on your, your office wall or your, your wall at home. So Scott last spoke to Focus in, in, um, in May of 2020. We had just started in on, on Zoom. Uh, we were Zoom only. And so much has changed his life since then. And we'll learn of those details, uh, get an update from him, what he's been, been up to in the past couple of years. We're a group of serious photographers, um, and I suspect that Scott will share some of the details that are pertinent to not only his photography, but his photographs as well. Scott's a self-taught Scottish photographer who moved to Denver roughly 2015 or so. And, um, you know, it was, it's been a pleasure to interact with him over the years. You know, so you'll see during this program that he's a gifted photographer and one worthy of receiving numerous awards and accolades. Uh, his passion working on several projects during the past year, years have greatly improved the lives of many, many people and many animals. And he'll, I'm sure that he'll, he'll get into those details with us a little bit tonight. On a personal note, okay, I want to express my sincere thanks to Scott you know, for agreeing to speak with us tonight. These programs require hours and hours of preparation, and that's not to be forgotten. And we have the luxury to basically sit back and enjoy this program. So Scott, thank you very much for all the work that you've done to prepare for tonight. And I, and I welcome you back to the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks, uh, Dave, for the introduction. Hello to all of you, many familiar faces, uh, many new faces. Uh, a bit like Marilyn, I, I was actually a member of Focus and probably left about the same time driven by geography. So it was very convenient when you were around the corner from Greenwood Village, and a lot less convenient now for me personally. But um, <clears throat> that, that, that's how that, that rolls. But I certainly have very fond memories of the club and many of the members. Uh, I was hoping to see Cliff Watson and Ron Cooper today, who, who, are, who remain friends to this day. I uh, hope to catch up with them um, separately. So <clears throat> as Dave said, I'm, I'm going to start sharing my screen so you can see what's going on. But, I presented in May 2020, I think we said. And so I've called this the Personal Journey Towards Photo Advocacy, part two. The part two is just sitting on the other two, uh, uh, screen in the bottom right hand corner. And part of the reason is part, part one is quite a lengthy presentation. It's kind of like an hour long. And, and I appreciate some of you are new. So I'm going to do a very sort of quick snapshot through that and then work through part, part two, if that makes sense. So <clears throat> I did want to qualify up front though, um, that tonight is about photo advocacy rather than necessarily the subject that I'm advocating for, if that makes sense. So I need to recognize that I am in a camera club full of uh, very, very capable photographers. And we're here to talk about how you might apply your interest to this kind of concept rather than me sell you on mine, if that, if that makes sense. So, so I'm going to talk about you know the, the experience I've had, the steps I've taken. Some are deliberate, some are just serendipity that they kind of conspire to, to have made me what I what I have termed a photo advocate. But I'm not here to expound beliefs and get into a big political debate about white horses, for example, because I, I know that that can go into all sorts of directions. And <clears throat> So with that in mind, I want to take you sort of step step back uh, in, in time here. Hey, Rand. Nice timing. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, so I, th these are kind of eight building blocks of the, of the previous presentation. So I started life uh, as a photographer top left in the UK, um, very committed landscape photographer. And that was really all it was about for me, was kind of landscape. I did try and excel in multiple genre because I'm very, very competitive. So if I didn't win the comp competition at the end of the year, I got very upset. And I realized that you, you had to be good at, at adequate at everything, even, even if you were sort of specializing in, in one or two things. So landscape became, became my speciality. Uh, before I moved here, I was in the landscape photography, your final four times in a row in the UK. So sort of 2011 to about 2015. 
Uh, and one of the highlights of my career was when they did a, a 10 year uh, anniversary book and they took the best of the best from 10 years. And one of my poppy images is sort of something proudly in there. So that, that, that was a, a wonderful moment for me. Then in 2015, as Dave said, we moved to uh, Colorado and I was working in the beer business alongside being a photographer at the time. So when my brewing boss said to me, you know, we, we want you to move to Colorado as a landscape photographer, of course, I didn't hesitate and just, just dived in with both feet. We spent the first year just touring uh, Colorado, every single corner and um, just got, got to love it, you know, from Steamboat to Telluride, sort of north, south, east, west. I was very privileged to have an office on the 48th floor of the um, 1801 California building. So basically facing the, the, the cash register building there. And that was one of the, um, if you imagine the landscape photography of the year was one of my breakthrough moments in the UK. This particular photo I think was one of my breakthroughs in Colorado. And I was just lying in bed. I live about 12 miles south of Denver in, in Greenwood Village. And I looked out the window and I could just see this kind of eerie, misty atmosphere. And as everyone in this room knows, I mean, Colorado is so dry, or Denver in particular, you don't see eerie, misty atmospheres. And, and, I, and I thought, well, if it's like that here, what could it be like um, 12 miles north? So I just drove like a bat out of hell. I reached 1801 California, got up in the lift, looked through the window. And these windows, by the way, they're, they're like two inches thick and they're covered in dirt. This is not easy to shoot through. But just as this mist was rising, it met, 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 met the sunrise. So that was just a, a, just a breathtaking scene. I mean, it's one of those moments that you just, you think, I can't screw this up. It's not about, I, I have not created a beautiful scene. I have simply tried to capture one that was in front of me. So that was all over the news, 303 Magazine, etc. And I was invited to join uh, John Fielder's gallery in uh, Santa Fe Art District, which was an absolute thrill. And then round about that time, top right, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer. So we're now in 2016, August, September time, that was stage four colon cancer. Uh, as you can imagine, life kind of stops um, at that point and photography was not the first thing in my mind. Um, <clears throat> but very quickly, you start to sort of, you know, once your, your oncologist says, hey, we've got a treatment plan, we're going to sort of try and work through this. So of course, I went to how does photography actually get me through this? After all, it's all of our therapy. Um, and especially when you're going through a challenge like, like that. And um, that's when the, the, the oncologist said, well, uh, a little bit of caution. One of the drugs we're putting you on is called panitumumab, um, which I have, it seemed about three years to master saying that. The spelling is just as complex. Um, <clears throat> panitumumab, better known as Vectabix, and, and it has uh, extreme photosensitivity. So. He said, even apart from the fact you're Scottish, you cannot go out in the sun at all while you're on this job. And I thought, well, I'm a landscape photographer. You know, you just knocked that in the head. Thanks very much. What about my therapy? And that's when it just occurred to me, we've got this abundance of state parks on our doorstep full of wildlife and you can drive through. And so I acquired a 400 mil lens and put aside the 14 mil lens and started driving through uh, uh, parks um, in, in and around Denver, mostly Cherry Creek State Park, because it was so close to my home, um, and uh, Rocky Mountain Arsenal, but all, you know, further afield as well. I built a wildlife portfolio in kind of short order uh, that certainly wasn't up there in terms of the, the quantity of the landscape, but it was, it was getting there in terms of uh, quality. And I was a member of this club at the time, and Kevin Holiday, I don't know if you remember it's a very good friend to this day and I was chatting to Kevin and, and it was like you know I'm working through cancer I, I think I'm getting through it I've got this idea for a book that could start to give money back and um, to, to to the cause if you like and he said you've got to go for it and what's more I'm going to help you and so I don't know if you know Kevin's also a graphic designer so he said I will design this book for free and then Cliff Lawson who I, who I guess you also know he took the photos on the cover and he took the photo of me on the back. So suddenly all these friends with photographic skills were popping up from all over the place. Jeff Johnson's another guy, I think many of you know, he, he dived in with some of the sort of printer connections and that kind of thing. So suddenly my personal individual crusade became a shared crusade. And I think that was just really what kickstarted in me, this notion of giving back to the community, doing good. I actually have to control myself just thinking back to that. It gets it get, it get quite um, upsetting, as you can imagine. Um, so we're still in 20, 
16, I was diagnosed. And then in 2017, um, I had this book ready to go, but I had determined that I did not want to launch it until I was um, NED, which is no evidence of disease. Uh, so I got that amazing news one year after being in treatment, so in 2017. And uh, as Dave said, I've got you know, a decent presence on Facebook and I hadn't said a thing about my illness. But I launched the book um, and told the world about my illness and told the world I had no evidence of disease all on the same day. So I think that's still to this day my most popular post ever. Uh, but what, what uh, most people in America don't know is that NED in Glasgow is NED, which means non-educated delinquent. So, <laughs> so a lot of my Glasgow friends weren't quite sure how to take those news. But as I say, that really launched me into uh, what I would call phase one of photo, photo advocacy, which is really trying to drive a message through the cancer community around, around getting screened. And that, that, I mean, I was absolutely focused on that. But it was still wildlife photography and general photography, and then the sales went to support um, that, that cancer cause. And then it became a little bit beyond that. And I realised that just because we're photographers doesn't mean we can't kind of go beyond and speak out and get bills moving and things like that. So there was actually a bill kicked off in Colorado to reduce the screening age for colorectal cancer from 50 as it was to 45. And just think back, I was diagnosed at 48, so that, that would have helped me kind of thing. So, so um, that's now standard recommendation um, across the US is that people should be screened from 45, not 50. So, so even if it's 1% of 1% of the contribution, I feel that that advocacy helped build towards that. Alongside this, I had, uh, through the wildlife career, discovered uh, this little corner in northwest Colorado called Samwash Basin. I say little corner, it's 160,000 acres. It's the size of greater New York. I mean, it's absolutely huge. And they had about seven or 800 horses just roaming uh, free uh, in, in, in that area. And that just became my new escape, my new therapy. And even though it's a four and a half hour, five hour drive from here, I'm just... I keep trekking there every two, three months and just come back with the most amazing wildlife experiences in terms of you know, the drama and tension there. I've said this before in talks, but I've been on the most wonderful safari to Zambia, and yet I have not found the drama and tension in Zambia that I have found in the northwest corner of Colorado. So, so if that, that's kind of in a snapshot, part one. <laughs> and, and now I'm going to start to take you through uh, part two. As I say, this is just one example of uh, the sort of photography I was coming back with um, from, from Samwash Basin. I call this true grit, uh, or Mustang grit, rather. And you, you can kind of see why. For those that can't navigate the picture, this is actually two horses uh, and, and mid-fight. So that's the head of one at the front and the legs of the other at the back. And you know, they're right to collide. And this is just an absolutely adrenaline-filled moment. You're advised to be 100 feet from the horses, and I try and maintain this at all times, but this this lot just galloped towards me. I was probably 15 feet from this, and I'm with a 16, a 600 mil lens, so this is completely uncropped. I, I, I couldn't give you an uncropped version of this. That is it. So, um, so that's uh, uh, something I'm very proud of. But again, it was still very much in the genre of a wild horse or a wildlife photographer going out there to appreciate the art and the beauty uh, of this environment. And then a year ago, um, uh, September 2021, they announced that uh, there was going to be a roundup uh, by, by helicopter in Samwash Basin. That's carried out by the Bureau of Land Management. And, and the idea is basically they, they are culling the herd and reducing numbers. Again, we're going to park the politics on that. That's just the fact of, of, of what we're dealing with here. And I felt a, a kind of visceral shift at that point. So I, I kind of, you know, I'm, if, imagine the day was September the 1st. I can't remember what it exactly was. But on August the 31st, I was a wild horse photographer, uh, loved these horses. And then on the eve of this roundup, I saw all these posts going out, you know, um, sort of almost mourning the beauty of these horses that were going to be rounded up and forgotten. And I thought, the roundup hasn't even started yet. And you've all given up. It's almost like, you know, it can't be stopped. And, and that totally, I don't know if it's the Scottish blood, but that totally fired me up. And so I, I, I was like, no, we can stop this. And as long as there's one horse, more that can remain on this land, it's kind of worth fighting for. So I started to take my 
beautiful photography of the horses and start to position that uh, with messages on Facebook. And I called that Freedom No More. And the, the, these were basically mastheads that I created for Facebook and then just donated and, and the community could, could, could adopt those. So that was a bunch of folds. And the idea is that any fold that was taken off would, would simply never be returned. You know, so that, that, they, this was basically their first and last year in the wild. And then below that, the, the Sandwash Basin horses in particular are kind of like Hollywood stars. You know, so, so these stallions, they, they just have enormous followings. And we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people that, that kind of support these horses. So putting their picture out there and just reminding people that these guys could be removed from this territory forever. It really, really started to cut through. And, and that, that's when I just started to feel some of that traction as going from a photographer to what I'm now terming a photo advocate. You can sort of see the shift. And then I started to adapt that further. So the roundup has now started, and, and, and I realized that, that I had to go and photograph it. You know, it, it's all very well you know, having beautiful pictures of horses and attaching a difficult message. Actually, capturing the difficult images um, uh, was what, what it was about. And of course, at this point, I've already got a gallery. I sell you know, beautiful pieces. This, this, there's no commercial element to this whatsoever. It's simply about getting uh, a message across. So, so I was there at the, I'm going to call it the front line, but, um, but there's, there's a phrase um, that's called uh, meaningful observation. And, and the idea is that um, as an observer, you are you're supposed to have meaningful observation of the operations that are going on. We were nine tenths of a mile from the trap scene. Okay, so I mean, even with a 600 mil with a two times converter, you are struggling to get anything sharp whatsoever. Now, the, so the this photo here is not one of those. Those three there are. Um, so, so you, you know, again, you, you're shooting from a distance. But, but uh, the top left, just to explain, is uh, in the afternoon, once they've rounded up horses, you get to have a little, uh, like a 15 minute tour to check their own okay, case so that, that they were shot from a little bit closer. But that's when you start to see some of the damage that's happening. And I'm not saying this is all horses, and this is a fraction of a fraction. But the fact, some are getting seriously harmed in, in the process of being rounded up. Media started to pick up on what was happening. Colorado politics uh, got involved, as you can see there, Wild Horse. Advocates call for help from Bennett, Hickenlooper, and, and, and Polis. Actually, Polis was the one that really sort of stood up for the horses and asked the BLM to stop the roundup. Um, but again, without getting into politics, it's a federal exercise. The governor is a, a state leader, um, and so he, he doesn't have direct authority to, to slow things down. Even. But the noise is building, and you know, it's getting louder. Thousands upon thousands of advocates at this point are sending letters to the governor, to the BLM, to the Department of Interior, uh, basically saying, just stop this round up. You know, you've already started, but you've got enough kind of thing. So that's the, that's the, um, the, the, the kind of trajectory we're on here. One of the messages I want to get through, though, is it, 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 it wasn't just about news. It wasn't just capturing the horror of the roundup. And, and never forget, as photographers, the power of storytelling and the power that we have to tell a story through an amazing image. So I'm going to tell you the story on the right, but just look at those numbers on the left as well. I mean, they, they, these are the reach numbers for my top five uh, posts last year, all, all, all kind of round up related. And, and so every single one of them is over 100,000 people. So that's the power of a photo to just get a point across uh, to a community. The story on the right, um, one of the, I talked about meaningful observation being a, a, a compliance uh, code requirement. So is keeping mares and foals together. Uh, but when they're chased, the helicopter should not separate a mare and a foal. And if that happens, it can happen by accident and every effort should be made to, to bring them back together. However, word went out, this, this little black foal, who's literally days old uh, at this point, uh, has been separated from her mother on the previous uh, evening and been basically all night in the wild without her mother because she's days old she needs milk every four hours yeah so this is a serious threat to, to her, her life i'm on this stand eight to nine tenths of a mile away from the trap site and we look up there's about maybe 10 people we look up to our left and we see this scene here we think oh fantastic that the, the foal has found a mare she's okay yeah she's going to get milk and she'll be fine and then, I don't know how observant you are, but there's a little bit of a bulge between the back legs. And, um, <laughs> and it kind of occurred to us, I thought, this, is, this isn't a mirror at all. This is a stallion. 
And this stallion basically started to descend the hill and bring the fold towards hill. I mean, it was just absolutely extraordinary. Uh, the Bureau of Land Management, um, and at this point, I'm completely aligned with them. They need to rescue the foal. They need to get the foal to help. The foal needs uh, milk. Um, so, so we were sent back to our cars at this point. So I don't know what happened next. Uh, ostensibly, it's for health and safety, but it's also so we don't get photos that look awkward. But uh, so, so, so there are no more photos. Um, so I'm, I go back to my car. They come, they say, right, you can come back out now. <clears throat> and basically, the foal and the stallion have been rounded up. Okay, so they're now in the trap site, eight tenths of a mile away. The foal is taken to an orphanage. So she's now safe. She's got milk, she's looked after, and, and as you'll see later, lives happily ever after. The stallion, who, by the way, has been named Merlin, these hundreds of thousands of followers give names to all these horses, okay? My issue with that is it depletes the notion that they're wild, but I totally get that people want to engage with it. So the horse is Merlin, okay? Merlin spends the night in uh, a pen, and then the following morning, he vaulted a seven-foot fence and escaped, and he's now back in the wild. So, I mean, it's just an extraordinary story. But that's that's the power. It, and your wow is, is, is what that whole community did. And that just fired people up. It's like, whoa, if this horse can recover, maybe we can all kind of get behind that. And it just, it, this, this particular story took off. So... There's a very large uh, horse magazine called The Played Horse. It's been the subject of a story there. It's been, it was published in, in Czech, in the Czech Republic, in a, in a Mustang uh, uh, magazine there. The story was turned into a poem. It's been turned into artwork. It's been turned into T-shirts. Every copy of that print that I sold last year all went to a sanctuary, which now uh, looks after. The phone now has a name, of course, called Stella Luna. Um, and so, so she's now... Uh, south of uh, Denver in Kiowa, in, in a sanctuary there called For the Love of Aria, being very, very well with Tanther. So, but again, the point is just catching that story can actually just galvanize a whole community and, and behind what's going on. And in terms of community, that gave me then that kind of desire to really connect further with that community. And, and I found that, um, you know, I'll be honest, I've kind of shifted from cancer to wild horses. And partly, part of that's mental health and, you know, just, when you've had stage, stage four cancer, thinking about it every single day isn't necessarily the best thing to, uh, to be doing, but thinking about horses every day was absolutely a driver for me. So uh, the, the, the horse on the left is a blind horse that, that, that would ordinarily have been slaughtered, but is now living out its life in, in, in a beautiful sanctuary with another 549 wild horses in California. Uh, the group at the top are actually five generations of, of Mustangs, so that they're, they're all related and all female. And they're called the Painted Ladies. Four of them have been rounded up and are at um, the Middleway Sanctuary in South Park. And so I also support them and all sales of that picture went to support that charity. The picture there is that little foal from the previous screen. Yeah, so she's now, she will be a year old on September 1st. And that was me just visiting her two weeks ago and got a little video there. So, so again, this, this, you know, connecting with your communities, photo advocacy, there's a lot of joy in that. It's not just, it's not just you know, an obligation. And, and I get really tremendous joy from that. And I guess the message to all of you is, you know, connect, finding your community. And if Cliff was here, I would be asking him to stand up and take a bow for the work he does with veterans. Because to me, that, 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 that's his version of wild horses. It's just, he's so passionate about it. He's so brilliant at it. And he's just giving back an, an amazing gift to, to the community. So I think we can all find our own community and make, make those connections. This just happens to be mine. So. <clears throat> okay. It doesn't always have to be nonprofit. Um, so obviously everything in the previous page was all about nonprofits, supporting them. You know, we are photographers, some of us are professional photographers, and we're trying to make a living from that as well. So growing your connections outside of Agbacy is perfectly legitimate. And I, and I took a stand at the Rocky Mountain Horse Expo uh, last year, which is a massive um, event in the um, Western Stock Show uh, arena. Loads of different vendors, etc. So I was along with a, a group of artists and um, writers uh, as part of the Equus Film and, and Art Show. And that was just a fantastic experience. And again, it opened me and the advocacy and my photography up to a whole new population of horse lovers that I didn't you know, have any connection with whatsoever. So again, if you're thinking about this kind of trajectory, think about the different ways, the different tentacles you can, you can put out there and, and take part. Thank you.
then take chances. Um, so I, I have, as I say, I, I'm competitive. I, I, I entered all the competitions in the UK. I entered Focus Camera Club. I, I've done national competitions, but I hadn't really sort of tackled global competitions. And then I entered one of my horse images, as you see it actually, um, called Anger Managing into the uh, uh, World Photography Awards last year. And I kind of went through a process of, I got a phone call around right about uh, January um, and I was on Cherry Creek State Park Lake and the ice is about that thick. And there's a dead deer in the middle of the lake. And I'm thinking, fantastic, this is just going to be, you know, wildlife heaven, the coyotes are going to come and going to be amazing. So I kind of waded out there. I'm, you know, I'm quite nervous at this point because, you know, you know how thick it is, you're still walking to the middle of the lake. <clears throat> and I get there and I'm crouched down for probably four hours and all I've seen are magpies. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and any wildlife photographer is having a bad day if all you see are prairie dogs and magpies. <laughs> um, and I was almost ready to go home and I got a call from uh, the director of the, the World Photography Awards saying, I just want to let you know, uh, anger management is on the shortlist for the um, uh, Wildlife and Nature Award. The World Photography Awards. Oh, thanks very much. That's fantastic. I forgot all about the coyotes. <laughs> and, and, and I would have been happy with that. <clears throat> and then I was setting up for the expo that I just described and I got another phone call. And I was really stressed and they didn't have my booth ready and I was in a bad mood. And I said, oh, hi, it's the, the marketing director for Sony. I said, oh, okay. Uh, so I just want to let you know that um, uh, you, you have won the, the wildlife and, and nature uh, competition. The world uh, told me, oh, thanks very much. It's fantastic. So all my bad mood went away. <laughs> and then about uh, three, and she said, oh, and by the way, you have to keep it a secret. So uh, this is like you're on a, a virtual reality show and you know the outcome and you're not allowed to tell anybody. <clears throat> and then two weeks later, she said, uh, you're going into the, uh, so as a category winner, you're going with all the other nine category champions, if you like, and, and so they'll select a winner. So two weeks later, she phoned and said, uh, I'd like to tell you, you won the whole thing. You are now the photographer of the year for the World Photographer Awards 2022. So I was obviously blown away. The biggest thing that's ever happened to me, photographically speaking, but again, the photo advocate kicked in. And, and it was important to me that what these horses are going through was recognised as much as I was as part of the award. So that's the official press release. And the official press release uh, basically said um, the, the image tension is symbolic of the conservation challenges facing wild horses in the American West, with these treasure animals being rounded up in record numbers and removed from public lands. By the end of 2022, there will be more wild horses in captivity than running free. That, that's, a, that's a platform of scale that I could never have hoped to achieve by myself. So my image won out of 170,000 entries, yeah, and, the, and then they're going uh, global, and, and the, the, the coverage was absolutely astounding. So basically this wild horse message, so the advocacy message is literally going global in, in all these publications in English, Spanish, Russian, Chinese, um, all, all over the world. So uh, that was a, a fantastic feeling to be able to do that on behalf of the horses that had helped me. So we got a nice family trip out of that. Uh, obviously back, back home for me. Uh, my dad, my sister came down from uh, Scotland to meet us in London. That is a, an area, a place called Somerset House. That's where they had the, the exhibition. That's me doing an interview with BBC Radio Scotland. So I was able to <laughs> go back to, you know, full on Scottish accent for that one. I would not have followed a second or anything. <laughs> and for the two hour show, every song they played had a horse theme. <laughs> to keep it going, it's wonderful. And then I came back to Colorado and said, "Well, you know, what do I do now? You know, I've just, you know, that, that that's it, kind of thing." And um, there were a number of things happening. So, um, and I've, I've called this "find your synergies and overlapping opportunities." And and you'll see through this that I, I try to be as opportunistic as possible. So I was on my five-year cancerversary, as they call it. And one of the themes the World Photography Awards people developed was, instead of dying, <laughs> Scott has won the Photography Awards. I and mean, it was almost as blunt as that in interviews. That, that was part of the message. And when I had launched uh, Through the Window five years ago, um, the team at Fox News basically interviewed me, you know, put the broadcast that. They said, we want you back. So five years later, you've won this big award, so we want to give you a platform to talk about that. 
And of course, we've got new gallery opening at the same time. So all these things just beautifully converge from a timing point of view. So we had just, uh, uh, let's say we, I'll show you the guys that I, I partner in the gallery shortly. We had a little gallery uh, in Sixth Avenue, sort of Cherry Creek North. And if you know Cherry Creek, if you've got something in first to third, that works. People will walk that far. People will not walk to six. And we, we find that it <laughs> costs very quickly. It also explains why the rent and six is maybe about a tenth of what it would be on the second or third. So, so we cut our losses and moved into a wonderful new space on West 8th Avenue, which is literally just 30 yards off Santa Fe Drive. Can you get people to walk 30 yards from Santa Fe Drive? No. <laughs> so if anyone's got ideas about how you drag people from Santa Fe Drive, 30 yards to our gallery door, I'm very, very great. But obviously the publicity helps and, and we've, we've had a, a lot of visitors, which has been fantastic. So on the left there, you've got uh, Tony Eitzel and uh, Kevin Schwalbe. Tony Eitzel is also a master framer, as, as some of you in this room might already know. So uh, I, I invite you to inspect this later. That's, that's obviously the, the image that won, but I, I wanted to share Tony's craft work in terms of you know, the deckled edge around prints and this, this beautiful denim mat that, that, that he creates. So just beautiful uh, artwork. Kevin Schwalbe is more of an up and coming photographer. So he's, he's, he's got some really nice space in there. And that's just me with my, my wife and her friend on the, the opening night of the gallery. So as I say, just this beautiful convergence of timing of winning the award, uh, really on a high in the media through, through some of the, the roundup coverage and then, then opening uh, the gallery. <coughs> And the first, um, uh, uh, the, sorry, the World Photographer Organization also got behind it. And one of their commitments is when you win our award, it's not just a one day thing, it's if you're there for the year and, and we will continue to support you uh, throughout the year. So, <clears throat> so there, there were really great support there. And then one of the things I want to, being an advocate, um, and there's a couple of in this room that, that know this. <laughs> It can be quite draining. You know, it's, it's quite um, it's quite an intense process. You're kind of on it all the time. And uh, my wife's from northern Spain. We had a chance to go back and visit family, and this is one of my favourite places to um, uh, really take a break. It's most beautiful, enchanted forest in, in the, the mountains in uh, the Basque country in northern Spain, and it really does have that Lord of the Rings feel. It's got this beautiful sort of emerald, misty, and uh, mossy atmosphere. And I went in there purely to you know, sort of re reconnect with my landscape photography genre. And as luck would have it, um, how is it? <laughs> Never before in my life have I seen wild horses in this forest, but they showed up and they're wild. They're called Patoka, which uh, means pot bellied pony in Basque. Um, <clears throat> The stallion on the right, I've been accused probably daily of placing that fern on his uh, 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 forehead with Photoshop. I don't even use Photoshop, but um, and, and I remind you that is a wild horse. You're not getting within 30 feet of it to put a piece of fern on his forehead. So, uh, so I was absolutely delighted to come away with that, uh, after having had that refreshment. So, and that's family, by the way. So that's uh, mother, father and son. And then I, I think uh, the point here is it doesn't, when you're connecting with a community, it doesn't always have to have this advocacy purpose. If you know, you don't, you don't always have to be driven politically to, to, to make change. Sometimes it's simply to connect with the community. So let's say my, my wife is Basque, my kids are half Basque. And uh, I saw um, this picture here and I, and I posted it on the, this, the, the result on Facebook and my oncological nurse, so she's French, just by coincidence, said, um, you should have a Basque night at the gallery. And I was like, don't be ridiculous. There's no Basque people in Colorado. And, uh, and uh, of course, I'm like, oh, hold on. And, and I Googled and instantly the Colorado Basque Club with more than a thousand members popped up. So, so I, within minutes, I was on uh, email to, to their chairperson and said, listen, I've got this gallery. I've been shooting the Basque country for the last 20 years. I want nothing out of this other than to host you guys. And, uh, let, let's just have a community party. So that's what happened on the 26th of June. So, so again, community connections don't always have to be about making change. This was simply about making connections and uh, 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 making that happen. So, 
And in terms of that, that sort of taking a rate, I think I was kind of conscious of being typecast. So, you know, like you're now a wild horse photographer, a wild horse advocate. And I was very keen uh, to not stop that. I, don't, I wouldn't change any of that, but also to maintain a reputation for, for other types of work as well. So uh, there was a competition in Lone Tree Art Centre, actually very close to here. And so I thought, well, actually don't enter a horse, just enter everything except a horse. And I chose my own theme of red. They didn't have that theme. And thankfully, uh, all, all three images, but in the bottom right, actually won the, the, the best in nature competition. So I was pleased with that. They're all up in Gallery 6 now in Santa Fe Art District. So, so again, you don't have to be 100% full on. In fact, sometimes recharging and, and going off actually helps you get, get back on course again. Uh, so, so don't forget to look after your charging. <clears throat> but in the meantime, 146 horses died in Canyon City, which is the holding area uh, just south east, southwest of Colorado Springs, place uh, basically adjacent to Canyon City Prison. Uh, there was an outbreak of disease and a number of horses that have been rounded up last year from West Douglas uh, uh, died. Um, to this day, they're not absolutely certain, but equine influenza is, is, seen, is seen as the cause. And as I say, 146 horses died and there was an outcry, as you can imagine, from advocates. But I think this is the, the, the moment I realised the advocacy word was almost as strong as the photo word, because I wasn't on to talk about photography, but I was getting phone calls and requests from American Wild Horse Campaign, for example, to be a spokesperson uh, for the wild horses in Colorado. And that's a really driving sense of purpose. I mean, every stakeholder in this programme has a voice except the horse. So the one that's actually been rounded up has no one to speak for it. So I think it's really important as, as an advocate that I'm willing to stand up and actually you know, express a point of view and a perspective uh, around that. Another one who really stood up was the governor of Colorado and his husband, the first gentleman, Marlon Reese. And uh, I, I was very aware of Marlon Reese's involvement, outspokenness, interest, dedication to the cause. <clears throat> We talked earlier about the, um, how advocates love to name horses. It's actually got to the point that if you photograph a newborn foal, you have the privilege as the photographer of naming it. Uh, so I discovered a little foal in Samwash Basin uh, just as this event was happening and, and quite consciously named it Reese uh, after the first gentleman, which again, it, it's a little bit like the Maryland story because there was actually some joy in that story. That, that was more explosive than some of the the more challenging ends and as you can see in the quote on the bottom left the first gentleman was absolutely delighted with that so i was it's it's really nice to give back and these things actually mean mean a lot to me then sorry it's just there you go and i and point is um, being willing and uh, ready to speak up behind the camera as well and, and at the end of the day you know there are two words there photo and advocate and this was about being a photographer so when I wasn't being interviewed, the photographs that I was willing to take were, were basically, you know, be becoming front page coverage uh, for the roundup, which has just concluded in Peon. So imagine Sandwash Basin happened in Northwest Colorado. That was at the time last year, not even uh, be a year in September. That was the largest roundup in Colorado history. Just last month, you had the new largest roundup in Colorado history at Peon's East Douglas, which is a area between Rifle and Meeker uh, uh, on the western slope. So I went out there and some days I was completely by myself. You know, th these are not popular uh, attractions. Um, so when I say by myself, I've also got a Bureau of Land Management executive and two um, policemen, just to make sure that I don't try and blow up the helicopter. Okay. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so again, getting those photos is really, really important. There's a photo you'll see later. Um, uh, from, from a compliance point of view, there was a, a horse uh, ran into a barbed wire fence being chased by a helicopter. And, you know, she, there was a mare, she's, she's got a tear across here. Um, and, and that's effectively a compliance breach because you're supposed to go out and, and, and search the area and look for these flaws then mark them with a red ticker tape. And, th and then, then that takes care of it because the helicopter pilot can see that there's a hazard to be avoided. So when that doesn't happen, clearly there's a danger to the horses. So part of our job, it's not just 
taking pictures to get the media, it's actually supporting the compliance effort to say, well, actually something went wrong here. Uh, and actually feeding that into the Bureau of Land Management and say, well, actually we need to be better next time. So this isn't just about stopping roundups. You know, there's actually, it's how do we improve things that are ongoing uh, right now as a watchdog? <clears throat> And then uh, I see my role is to keep building the con 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 conversation. So I, I showed you earlier some of the, I think, beautiful horse images that we've got up in the gallery. But I think it's important to show that darker side of things. So, so I've actually uh, dedicated a corner of the gallery to round up images, which are not for sale. It's simply there's this kind of documentary piece. And the idea is that people come in and, and have a conversation. Uh, Santa Fe Art District are behind that and actually promote it. They're always looking, I think, for sort of more, more interesting uh, uh, esoteric uh, subject matter. Uh, and, if, you know, just, just read the thing in the centre. So, you know, only two wild animals are afforded protection as symbols of American freedom under federal law, the bald eagle and the wild American mustang. When the Wild and Free Roaming Horse and Bull Act was passed in 71, there were more than 50 million acres of American West that mustangs called home. In the 50 years since competition with private livestock for rights to graze on our public lands has seen that land cut in half with a constant threat of cruel culls and lifelong confinement in federal facilities. There, I said I wouldn't get political. Okay? The September 2021 roundup at Sam Wash Basin removed 684 beloved Colorado Mustangs, at the time the largest cull in state history. In July 2022, that ignominious record was surpassed when the pleas of the Colorado state governor were ignored and 867 wild horses, including pregnant mares and 166 newborn foals were rounded up by helicopter at the yard space. So that's what this is all about. And that's just some of the pictures. You know, I'm never going to sell any of those. This is, this is about just getting a message across. And so I certainly invite all of you and anyone listening to come in to gather and ha have a conversation. Um, about, about these images, what it means and, and what, what we can do to reduce that kind of harm uh, going forward. In terms of what's up and coming, I've had two documentary crews kind of following me around uh, this summer, one uh, by the American Horse, Horse Campaign, uh, so that will come out in the fall, be very happy to share uh, that story. Um, so basically just a moving version of everything you just heard. Uh, and another, um, the lady that took on those 550 um, uh, adopted wild horses in California. There's a, there's a kind of story there that connects a number of people and it was all about the therapeutic power of wild animals or wild horses in, in this case. And certainly that's been the effect on me. It's been the effect on the family that's running the ranch on her, her behalf. And it's been the effect on her. So that, that is also the subject of a new documentary which will be about the therapeutic power uh, of, of animals and horses. So that, that's something else that I'll be delighted to share uh, in the near future. And then if you can take more of the same or you want to hear the full story, um, uh, including a sort of longer version of the first half, I will be talking at the Photographic Society of America conference in Colorado Springs next month. So I think I am the Wednesday evening speaker. Uh, a personal journey towards social advocacy. So in many ways, this has been a dry run for them. So I, I would be delighted to hear any feedback or improvements or any things that, that, that you want to add into that. But hopefully I'll see some, some of you at that festival. It, it's certainly not far enough away for that to be an excuse for it. <laughs> okay, that is me. If any of you want to keep in touch, uh, there's a number of ways of doing that. Facebook, Instagram, uh, visit the website, and uh, I'd love to see you in person at the gallery if you get a chance to visit. So, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, just an incredible uh, presentation. Um, I guess I'd like to open it up probably to people at Lone Tree, and then we'll, we'll basically open it up you know, for the people on Zoom to ask questions. I think it's gonna try to kind of manage, you know, manage this, but are there people in the room that have questions for Scott or comments? Doesn't have to be questions. So Bob? It's probably obvious. Are you shooting with a Sony? <laughs> no, actually, no, uh, no, I'm shooting with Nikon. And the, I think it's one of the beauties of that competition that there's no one has ever asked me what I shot or, or asked me to qualify it. So I think, and I, I think that's good on Sony for, for having an attitude. It was all about the photographers and, and the photography. 
Sony has been the only sponsor of that competition since inception. And I think it's been going about seven or eight years. I, I might have the number wrong, but it's of that magnitude. Uh, so, so no, well done, Sony, for, for not being <laughs> tight about it. So. Scott, Todd Lytle, I'm on a road trip, but I just wanted to say to the group um, um, that obviously I've known you since you were a member, but I've followed you almost daily uh, on your Facebook for years. And um, you're the single most passionate person that I've ever met uh, with regard to their photography and your mission and your vision. And if people don't, um, if people who are on Facebook do not have you, if you're not connected to Scott Wilson, you are doing yourself a disservice um, it will make you a better photographer and it will make you more passionate about the, the kind of photography that you do and um, can, can, can share with others. Uh, the new gallery space is fabulous, really, really fabulous. Although I must say I did walk to the Sixth Avenue location. So. <laughs> and I walked the 30 yards from... Um, <laughs> Santa Fe. In fact, I took the picture of the two guys. Uh, you did. You did. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to need. need to oh, sorry. I, look, I'm looking for. I'm looking for. Uh, I don't know. I didn't get a model release, so I guess I can't get. <laughs> so anyway, to say uh, you've given so much to this club, I know because I follow you almost daily. Um, I, I don't. I don't know how you're sitting in this room right now. You are literally the busiest photographer with this kind of commitment of advocacy for something of meaning uh, that I've met in my 30 years of photography. So I, I don't know how you have time to be here, but we really appreciate it. Thank you, Todd. And it's back to people. People like Dave, people like you, people like Cliff. That's why I came back. So thank, thank you for those kind words. You had a question from, I'm sorry, I don't Oh, yes, uh, Gigi. Gigi. Yeah, that so was I, was, I was curious to know, um, as a photographer, that, that uh, line that you said that you had a photographer to advocate, um, how much education did you have to put into that step? Because from what I've seen, you took a tremendous amount of effort to uh, support or, or tag organizations that, that the little research I did on the site um, are truly trying to to help the cause so as, as you said taking apart whatever cause one may be involved with do you did that take a lot of education or was that more passion and just happen to be the people around you that way? yeah uh, thank you for that it, it took a lot of research rather than education and, and i find that the best way to give a perspective is via an expert voice so so and, and i don't claim to be an expert voice in this field so my, my the expertise i'm bringing to it is photography. In every other sense, I'm an aggregator of expert information, and I will seek it out and, and then put it out there. I then joined the board of the American Wild Horse Company in order to develop more expertise and more influence in, in this space. But um, education, yes. Assimilation of information, yes. But um, uh, I don't yet think I, I'm an expert. There, there are just so many experts out there, and I lean on them. And what I do is I then give them a platform. So, you know, so I would say an expert voice and just put it to 100,000 people. There's maybe someone in the back that had a question. I see it too. Yeah, Tony, please. Thank you. Um, this year's roundup wasn't supposed to be until September, was it? Correct. Was there any reason given why it was like that? So, um, the, the, the reason given. So the reason it was going to happen in September is that's a cooler time of year. Foals have matured to the point that they can sustain a chase from mm -hmm. a helicopter. Obviously, I would prefer not to see helicopter around us at all, but I accept that's a better time of year than, than the baking heat of summer. The, I went to uh, Piotr's Basin and started exposing some of uh, what I was uncovering, the, 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 the reasons for the roundup, which were malnourished horses, on malnourished, you know, uh, sorry, bad range, weren't wholly true. They were partly true, but weren't wholly true. 
And then the governor said, well, actually, let's just, this is an English expression, put a foot in the ball, just pause and, and, and uh, delay the roundup pending further conversation. At that point, the Bureau of Land Management accelerated it rather than delayed it. So they brought it forward from September to July, which is a much hotter time of year. I had been there at the end of June and there was still, I mean, swathes of pregnant bears, you know, just about to give birth. There was a, a friend of mine that visited, she runs a sanctuary, she, and again, an expert, I don't know these things. She's saying, I can see placenta on, on these foals. So that, that's what you're suddenly chasing with a helicopter. So the notion that they'd rounded it up, uh, brought it forward three, three, four months to me was almost unforgivable. The, 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 there was no real rationale. Their rationale was, we, uh, the original rationale, we got to round them up because they're unhealthy. Then I proved they were healthy. Then, then the narrative changed that we're now going to round up because they're healthy. That's the best time of year you can sustain a helicopter. So just the goal is the rounding them up and, and whatever explanation is required is what gets put out. Second question, Switch your horses. It goes to the advocacy, mm -hmm. okay? You've been shooting the horses for four or five years. Yeah. In a field that's got, like you said, experts who've been doing this entire life. Is photography the platform that gave you credibility with these people? Or because you can't just walk in and tell them, I'm an expert. You're not an expert in this, but you're an expert photographer. Mm -hmm. So is it is photography, obviously, is that the what gave you the... No, um, partly. Part, so, so I qualified no. Um, and I'll tell you why. So with all my credentials as a photographer, I went on to the, it's called the Photography Show. It's a, it's a podcast on um, uh, the internet. And they wanted an interview about wild horses. And so I gave wild horse photography, not wild horse politics. <clears throat> so I gave that interview. I talked about you know, all my tips about how to take the best photos, when to go, how to go, how to dress, make sure you get the best tires, all this kind of stuff. And I got lambasted by these experts, basically saying, why are you not using this as a platform to talk about the issues facing wild horses? And it blew me away. And I, was, my, I, I got defensive. So, well, I'm talking to a photography community. I'm not talking to a bit like tonight. And so I actually went in my shell for a little while, for a couple of years. It was like, oh, no, I, I'm not putting my head above the parapet if that's, that's the response. Until some more spacing happened. And then it was like, hold on, these are my horses. I've got to do something about this. <laughs> And that's when I put my head above the parapet, not as a photographer, but as an outspoken advocate. And that's the moment that changed. Okay. So, so the, I think the photography was assumed, and, and but it was it was that the trust was earned by by speaking on behalf of the horses. Thanks, Scott. I've got a question, kind of to follow up on with what Tony was asking. I, you know, I think that there was a lot of, of interest. There was a lot of uh, coverage on the sand horse base on the roundup. But I don't remember seeing much on, P on, on the PM's basin. So, I mean, have people kind of lost interest? Have we gone into a different news cycle? And so, so it, it's, yeah. it's puzzling why, why we haven't seen more coverage. So, uh, a, a little bit of both. So, so the, there has been quite a lot of coverage. So, if you're on the Western Slope, for example, it was in the Grand Junction Sentinel nearly every day. So, okay. so depending on where you are, so. Fox 31 in Colorado Springs, we're regularly covering it. Again, they're a little bit closer. So it was on Fox 21, it was on Denver 7, it was on 9 News, okay. it was in the Denver Post. So all of these um, uh, outlets covered it, but not as persistently. And I think that goes to the fame and notoriety of the Sam Marsh Space and Horses. Okay. I mean, I, and again, literally hundreds of thousands of people follow these horses from all around the world. So they were just on the phone to media, politicians, you know, every single day. And I think that just keeps that, that noise up. So there is far, far less of that going on around peons, but peons still stopped early. Okay. So, so, the, so, so and I believe the pressure from advocates ha has a role to play in that. So they were looking for 1,050 horses and, and they came away with 864 Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you for, for addressing that. Is anybody else in the room? I, 
I'm sorry, I don't remember you. Marilyn. Marilyn. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I remember you from the last thing. <laughs> what is your opinion of sterilization of these animals to control numbers as opposed to rounding up and removing? Yeah, so th there's a there's a suite here of um, uh, not touching them and sterilization, and in the middle is fertility control. So, and I would support fertility control as a means of managing a population where it's necessary. I would still prefer to see alternative solutions. Um, I'd still prefer to see uh, the, the number that, that is allowed to be their challenge in the first place. I mean, th that's a very arbitrary number that's out there in terms of what can be on public lands. There's a fence put around it. Wild horses have uh, freedom to roam at 12% of public lands. And of that 12%, 75% of the forage is allocated to livestock. Mm -hmm. Okay, so before we get into fertility control, we should also talk about the amount of land and the amount of horses <coughs> that are allowed to roll in that land. But if we're in, if that's not going to change and we have to manage the population, you can do it through temporary measures like fertility control with a drug called PCP, which is also used in Africa to manage populations of uh, giraffes and elephants. So it's, it's a very well understood wildlife fertility control treatment that's a long way short of sterilization and i'm and, 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 and not sticking my hand up for sterilization what is um it basically uh, temporarily like, uh, it breaks the ability to conceive so, so, no, it's a dart so people <laughs> uh, and that's when you need advocates to go out with it's a gun but it's basically just firing a dart <laughs> and once a mare has been darted twice she, she's then protected from uh, 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 conception for a year one year. Two okay. years. Okay. Thank you. Um, have any plans for 2023 been announced? For roundups? Yeah. No, I think there's still, uh, I haven't even finalized the winter plan for 2022. So. Yes. Okay. Um, Dr. Wayne, I wonder what your opinion is of how your photo of the horse is tripping, the actual. Not even the afterwards, but the actual one where they're the feet are up in the air and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, because interestingly, the roundup ended the next day, and that that landed in the paper. Um, so when you talk about advocating and photo, you know, journalism, mm -hmm. I I personally feel like those photos, that series of photos, may have ended that roundup. It it, it's, it would have been part of the consideration set. Certainly, the, the, there was a number of things going on at that time. They were finding less horses, so I think part of that reduction from ten fifty to eight forty eight forty six is they, they weren't finding the horses that they said were there. So, so, so the overpopulation so it starts to go away, and then there's mistakes being made. And when you start to add up all these different things and the cost, it costs forty eight thousand dollars to round up and and confine a horse for life in a pen versus $2,000 maximum to implement the fertility control that we've just described. So, you know, as a taxpayer, you should be absolutely outraged by, by what's going on. So thank you. I, I agree it was, would have been part of it, but I don't think it was all of it. But um, certainly the BLM guy was not happy seeing that happen, especially <laughs> if you've got to have a look at my camera right now, because this is going to Facebook in an hour. And I went back to my car and I tethered my phone and I downloaded that image and it was on uh, online in 20 minutes after, after that wow. Well, interestingly, when I was out there with Gina, um, mm -hmm. they they were running a full up the hillside and I said, you should stop this. You're running the foals up this loose shale. And they said, well, we didn't see that. I said, I have a photo right here. They said, we didn't say that it's not happening. We said we didn't see it. I quote. So did you have experiences like that with those folks? Yeah, the, 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 there's a lot of, uh, what I do, the, I realise that I'm not going to win any battles while I'm out there, <clears throat> so I just basically do my job, take photos, come home, and then allow the photos to be talking. You, you, will, you will not change policy yeah. while you're in the field. So, 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 so yes, I've had those experiences. Snap away and just like try yeah. to... You asked Gina how much I spoke, not hardly at all, all day. So just let, let, let your... So she'll do the talking. 
Well, I think we're gonna switch gears and ask the, if the people uh, attending the meeting on Zoom uh, have any questions. So I think we're kind of dominating the, the questions, but, and we'll come back to the people in the room, but I wanna give the people on Zoom kind of their, their, fair, their fair opportunity. So please unmute yourself and please ask Scott. Sure. So the silence is, is deafening, but I can also I can also see the chat. If anyone wants oh, to put anything in there, feel feel free. Yeah. So. yeah, Scott, this is Carl. Um I appreciate you coming back to us and, and giving us an update on the new stuff that's been happening in your life and um wonderful, wonderful presentation, wonderful work that you're doing. Uh, hopefully it'll maybe even inspire a few of us to think about what we can do in our communities too. Um, and also, uh, just for anybody who's on Zoom, in the chat, I did put Scott's website, Facebook, and also the link for that uh, PSA um, festival that's going on in Colorado Springs. If anybody's interested in um, going down there you know, for Scott or for anything else that the festival is doing, uh, that link is in the chat. Thank you, Carl. Appreciate it. Sir. Anybody in the room have more questions, comments? I have one. Mm -hmm. um, I'll probably have another one as, as we, we move along. But you know, the, the anger management photo that, that you won this this phenomenal award. Could you kind of talk a little bit of the background? I mean, it's it's an interesting image. Yeah. And I'm gonna so <clears throat> That, it doesn't have on the screen for people, does it? Um, it does, you can see it. Okay. <clears throat> and don't worry, it's not touching the screen, it's just touching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Anger Management was photographed in the Samwash Basin in July 2021. This is actually a dark brown horse, keeping the naming thing, his name is Quiver. I actually kept that name a secret for over a year. Because to me, I wanted him to be symbolic of the challenges facing all wild horses. But I simply got persecuted by advocates till I'd said what his name was. So I had to, I had to review it. <clears throat> he's very close to a watering hole. So there's a watering hole uh, just round about here. And he's thirsty. It's middle of summer, as I say. And he's basically pounding the ground to let the other stallions know that he's uh, ready for a drink. So some people think this looks like snow and ice. Some people think it looks like a cloud. It's actually dust that, that's just um, uh, spraying around him. This line around his body, again, someone said, that's not a wild horse. You can see where he's been clipped with, with <laughs> no, he's actually been in a mud pool up to his, his midriff. And he's yeah. come out and, and it's like a hundred degrees. So the mud just bakes almost instantly and he's sort of tossing his mane around there. So but to me, one of the things that made this stand out um, is the vantage point. And if you imagine the height of a horse and the height of us, and, and we all pride ourselves, I think, of getting eye level but with, with animals. Here I'm actually on a little bit of a slope. Um, it's an area called Lake Draw within San Wash Basin. It's quite a steep slope looking down at, at, at the watering area. So it's actually given me a very unusual, slightly elevated view, where it looks like I'm taller than the horse. So I think it's given that kind of almost um, sky-like perspective of you're looking down the horse which is looking down on, on, on the earth below the clouds kind of thing so that was certainly one of the features uh, the judges pulled out so that's kind of the story there he's, he's managing his, his his frustration with the other stallions and needs to get his drink well thanks it's just nice to know kind of the backstory of mm -hmm. that so yeah thank you okay So as a veterinarian, I'm wondering about the injection to stop the tilt of the mirrors. Many years ago, they had one for female dogs, which resulted in an infection in the uterus and required surgery to spay the females. The drug to company never admitted to this, but it was not used anymore. We never had the problem anymore either. I hope this does not happen to the mirrors. Well, it's a great question, Judy. That's certainly one of the concerns about another drug called Gonacon, which is uh, the jury's still out. But as far as PZP, Goes. It has been in the system for decades. It, it's, it's very well tried and tested. It's been in, in the horse system in the US for, for many, many years. And as I say, uh, used on African wildlife for many years as well. 
Uh, I am not aware of any scientific um, uh, problems that have been identified, and I think I would have been um, uh, made aware of those. So, great question, Judy. Certainly, there's, there's a lot of scepticism about any new drug that comes on the scene to help uh, uh, help in inverted commas manage the population of horses, but PZP seems to be acknowledged as, as the tried and tested uh, solution. Okay. Um, has there been any discussion about in the same way about like which range oh, management yeah. in the same way with um, out on the plains with cattle so in, in order to preserve various pastures they rotate mm -hmm. the where where the animals are grazing so areas are not overgrazed um, that would seem to me to be a less invasive solution or possibly has there been any talk about that uh, I, I think there's constantly talk about this i mean that that to me is the job of of the bureau of land management is, is to make best use of these lands their argument would be that they're, they're there to manage multiple uses which includes livestock uh, oil and gas wildlife and wild horses my argument would be that that 12% should be predominantly managed for, for wild horses. So as long as you've got that single issue versus multiple use issues fighting each other, then range management is, is always going to be a problem. So my, my solution to range management is take the livestock off the land. It, the, remember, this is public land. This is, this is not private land. The, 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 the public land grazing is, I think, is it? A 35th of the price of private land grazing. So again, taxpayers are subsidizing the, the, this, this, this grazing. So yes, you're absolutely right. That, that should be more fully explored and more fairly explored. Try as I might, we would not avoid the, the politics. Oh. I, appreciate, I, I, I appreciate it staying uh, as a balanced conversation. Certainly, whatever cause you could be hired is better for it because after knowing you, as I know you're one of the most dedicated people I know as well. And just with the cancer, you know, colon cancer and the horses, it's really been great to see that energy takes someone special to, in my opinion, to really make that change. Thank you. Uh, I, I have been asked and it's in the documentary whether that image is actually a proxy for my cancer journey and, and it is what it is. So just one question as a you ask as many as you like Gigi. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I I also enjoy top door photography. How do you take care of yourself? Because we are so high up here, you know, with the sun and everything. I, are there just what do you do as a, on a practical level, like uh, sunscreens or, or long skirts, shirts, or what have you? What, what do you? I um, uh, discovered an organisation called Free Fly Apparel, which uh, was basically uh, producing gear for fly fishing mm -hmm. who, who are out and, and they need to cover, but they also get very hot. So, and they make clothing out of bamboo. And it's so cool. And so I just stroll around Sandwich Basin with like long sleeves, this hood, my hat. I still wear a face mask even though I'm no longer in treatment. So I thought you were going to ask about food. And I was going to say, after having stage four cancer, I felt the horse had bolted. So I have no, <laughs> I have no limits on myself whatsoever. I just figure that uh, I've already paid my price. <laughs> uh, but, I, but I do protect myself from the sun. Well, I think people have run out of questions. So, okay. unfortunately. so but I, I think I hope that people will take advantage that you're here. And have um, excuse me, Dave. Um, there is actually one more in the chat. Dominic just posted one. Thanks, Carl. Oh, Thank yeah. Hello, Scott. Out of curiosity, how much editing do you choose to do when taking photos for activism purposes? I imagine that falls under the journalistic ethics for editing. Since you also have more of an art background with photography, how do you decide which degree of edits to make? I think that's a great question. Um, there's probably a spectrum for me of um, 
most edited and least edited. And still my landscapes will be the most edited because I'm trying to display a vision that I have of that landscape and bring it to life as realistic and natural as possible. As my printer, Tony knows, my worst fear is fellow photographers or critics saying that was over-processed or oversaturated. Yeah, so that's my biggest fear. So I, I, if anything, err towards under-editing. If I look back at my Flickr catalog over the last 15 years, the first five years have no processing whatsoever. The second five years are all processed to death and I hate every single one. <laughs> and I think the last five years, I might just have got the balance right, but I haven't still answered the question properly. If you look at the wall in my gallery, which is dedicated to the roundup photography, they're not processed at all. It's simply cropped. So, so that there, that if, if there's any processing, it's about brightness and shadows. That's kind of it. And then, and then it's just the photo. So, um, so no, it, it, it just want to be as raw. And it's not because I, I feel the need to maintain a journalistic ethic. I, if I felt I was going to do a better job on behalf of the horses by processing them, I would. But I just think in those circumstances, you're trying to tell just a very documentary style story. So I'll just present the images as they are. Anger management falls between the two. You know, to me, that is a that's my version of fine art. So, of course, it's processed. It's black and white. You know, and I always think it's funny when black and white purists talk about over processing. So, like, well, black and white process. <laughs> so, um, so, 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 yeah. So, yes, I will process when it's an art subject, but much less so when it's a documentary subject. Does that answer the question, Dominic? Uh, yeah, it does. Thank you. I just typed it out so you get it out more coherently, but thank you. That was very good, very informative. Cool, thanks. Scott, I would say in all our years of uh, presentations, I've never heard anybody say that their children are half best. <laughs> there you go. Thanks. <laughs> What annoys me is my son sometimes says, yeah, I'm half Basque and half English. <laughs> so that's even worse. So you can scold him when you see him for that. Time. Is, he, is he still running track and field? No, he, he discovered college and all the excesses of college. And, and to be fair to his whole generation, COVID, just went out for so many of them. So my son was, was uh, very heavily into track. He was the fastest 100 meter runner in Colorado at the age of 14. Wow. And, uh, and he won state at 15, 16. It, they had the most, to this day, still the, the, the record for the four by four, just an amazing team. And then, and then COVID hit and just, just find other things to do. So, so no, no, no more, no more track shots, Todd. <laughs> we actually, we have no idea. <laughs> Neither of us have a, a track gene to our <laughs> I had the right, he, he also played rugby for Colorado. That, 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 that was my sport as a, as a youngster, but I don't claim to have reached his heights. Do you want to give your daughter fair building as well? My daughter, Alba, her name is, is to your point, Todd, is half, she, she's, it's a Spanish name, which means uh, sunrise, but it's also, I imagine most of you don't know, Gaelic for Scotland. So Alba oh. is, is sunrise and Scotland. And she represented Colorado this year in the national debate finals. So that's her thing. So I no longer win any arguments whatsoever <laughs> in my house. I'm a very precocious 16 year old. <laughs> Is your son at all interested in photography? I know Alba said she's not. But... So um, Andrew is not. They, they are interested in, in iPhones, same as their whole generation. <laughs> Alba said she wasn't, but she's just signed up for photography in her last year at high school. And I was oh. absolutely delighted. It's Cherry Creek High School. I, I normally present there once a year just to give them a story. And, and they said, no, Dad, I just did it from the so I, I got very upset at that point. <laughs> and then I said to her, I'm going to talk to the class teacher about that wall I've got for documentary work. I said, I'm going to give that to the class. So maybe like the top four or five 
class performers can have space in a gallery in Santa Fe Orchestra. I thought it'd be a nice thing to do. And suddenly, <laughs> interesting. Uh, <I> like it. <laughs> so hopefully you'll see a show by kids uh, oh, at, at the end of next year. So again, that's the sort of thing we don't have to, it doesn't always have to be a big advocacy call. It can just be something nice to do for the local kids. Well, I'm certainly going to walk the 30 yards from Santa Fe. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's, on, that's on my list, and I, I would encourage all the, the people that are attending and, and watching this video, you know, that, uh, that because these videos are posted on our website. And so hopefully they're that draws some business. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Bring my wife down. So, so. No, thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. And, and honestly, tonight isn't about business. I'm not here selling no, no. books or anything. It's no. about just connecting with fellow photographers. But that's another way to connect with you yes, and absolutely. have a nice conversation. Because I know that you're quite busy. You've got a family. You've got some of your cancer advocacy work as well. So you wear a lot of hats. You've got yeah, a I'm a full-time consultant place. outside of all of this as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. For the record, the best parking is actually west of the studio because everybody wants to park near Santa Fe. But if you don't go down there for one of these first Fridays, I'm assuming they're going to do a first Friday over Labor Day, but maybe I don't know. And they cl are they closing the streets, Scott? I know earlier they were not, but they did, they did it in August. August they did. Yeah, they did August it in August. 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 There, was, uh, there was like 20, 25,000 people it apparently. Was, yeah, I, I want my Yeah, it's uh, so that, much it's, fun, mm -hmm. and the people watching and the galleries and the they do a street with food trucks. It's literally one of the best things to do. Um, on a Friday night in Colorado. And I'm assuming it goes through, does, do they do it in October, Scott? If, if people don't want to go on Labor Day, is it? Is it There's a first Friday every month, but the only one where they actually close the street is in August. August. Yeah, so that's just me. But that doesn't mean you, you know, it's very white people, so you can still, you know, don't, don't be put off by that. Yeah. <laughs> There's so much going on down there. I didn't even notice. I was like close to the street the first time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was there for your opening. It's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's fascinating and fun. And there's music going on everywhere. And just it's food. And your gallery is oh, fabulous. fabulous. It really is. Well, in normal times, we have cookies and juice. But I've been looking around yeah. wondering where the catering people are. Yeah. I think COVID put a, a, a damper on a lot of things. So yeah. that's one of the things that's, um, that has happened. So, but again, Scott, thank you very much My for, for agreeing to come down and speak to us. I mean, I'm very encouraged with the turnout. So you're a big draw. You know, we, I guess the last time we were here, we had five people in the room. So yeah, so this speaks volumes to, no, uh, to, to you. So thank you once again. Thank you very much, Dave. Thanks, everybody.